Yeah. So, yeah, so um, some of you guys might not take that class. So we'll do at least one week on game theory, too, and then do some um, probably, uh, I don't know, I forgot. So uh, tonight, though, we'll look at Monopoly. So single firm, maximizing profit, no competition, single firm. What's a good example? Um, I don't know. There's not a lot of these. So an example of a monopoly. You guys pay electric? Oops. That would be elsewhere. <laughs> it's usually the most obvious. What about Amazon? Amazon's are contentious. Google. What about Google? Yeah. Google's Google monopoly? Pretty close. Yeah, so uh we're going to look at, of course, the theoretical extreme. The model we look at, actually, you can use for quite a bit of um, things outside of monopoly. The whole point uh, today is that, or yeah, today, I guess, this week, whatever you call it, um, is the firm's going to be producing some product Q, uh, sort of like in a perfectly competitive market. If you remember a perfectly competitive market, um, from a single firm's perspective, uh, the idea was they had no pricing power. So a perfectly competitive market, <laughs> um, perfect competition. Uh, we said, you know, uh, the firm's a price taker, meaning that if they try to raise the price uh, nobody buys a product. So you have no ability to raise your price at all. Um, so you simply just take the market prices given in a competitive market and you sell whatever you want at that price. No matter how much you sell in terms of Q, more or less, on the horizontal axis, that price just stays at some P. So from a, a single firm's perspective, Usually the way they'll put that is that the demand curve effectively, from an individual firm's point of view, basically looks horizontal. So meaning that if I sell a lot more, like I double my output, um, it, I can still sell it at the same price. So there's just some price P1 and that's it. Um, this is a case of elasticity that would be very, very elastic. So I think they call this perfectly elastic. Um, and what we look at tonight instead for monopoly is something different where you just have in mind a case where the firm, in fact, does have some ability to move the price around, unlike a firm in a competitive market. So same setup, just something where uh, when the firm looks out there in the market and is analyzing the demand for its product at different prices and might charge, um, they see something more like this, right? Where they can charge a, a price like P1, like $100 per unit, and they sell a certain number of units, but they don't have to charge P1. All right, so the monopolist here, um, whereas in a perfectly competitive market, the firm is a price taker, you might call this more like a price maker. Sounds good. Price maker, not a price taker. So um, that demand curve is uh, the demand for this single firm's product. <laughs> and you can see certainly that um, I can raise price. So if I raise price above P1, um, I can still sell product. Uh, there's always a trade-off. Even though the firm is being a monopolist, of course, the definition of monopolist, we all know what I assume we all know what that means, right? Just no, no competition. So even though there's no competition, um, there's still constraints, of course. A key constraint is that you always face a downward sloping demand curve if you're a firm, even if there's nobody else selling the product. So if I do want to raise the price to P2, 
Um, as you can see there in the picture, you have to give something up, right? There's some sort of quantity effect where you sell less units, um, though you can sell them at a higher price. All right, so this is my um, my price maker that I want to look at as opposed to the price taker. <laughs> so we'll assume there's no competition, single firm. Uh, you can use the same model that we're going to do work on this week for, for other applications. If you want to just make a little bit loosey-goosey, like, so to speak, you have a firm maybe in the local area that's selling a product. And for some reason, they face a demand curve that looks like this. And it's sort of a reasonable assumption. So I have some local coffee shop or some local manufacturer in Delray Beach producing a product. And they may argue my demand curve sort of looks like this a little bit. That is, I can raise the price and I can still sell um, some units. Although I face competition, there's some brand loyalty or whatever, some geography that's affecting the demand for my product. So you can actually use this model that we look at tonight, monopoly model, for quite a few other applications. All right, so let's take an example. And uh, sort of what we'll do is construct a profit maximization problem for a, a firm as a monopolist solve it and then uh so what we'll do is we'll do profit maximization let's be fairly straightforward it's a little bit more involved in a perfectly competitive market simply because when you have a monopolist <laughs> um the price is no longer fixed so the price um is something that uh, will adjust depending on how many units i want to sell and then secondly, uh, the second main category that always comes up in this week of monopoly is uh, talking about welfare. All right, as we probably remember from maybe other classes, uh, monopoly usually, at least at first glance, always gets a bad rap. Monopoly's bad. Like, aren't they going after Google for this? So they have entire federal departments, antitrust set up to try to discourage monopoly formation, encourage competition. Sometimes they hire PhDs in economics, finance, accounting, work in antitrust, and try to discourage monopoly formation in the marketplace. Not good for America, something like that. So we want to look at the question, uh, at least this week, is. Uh, how come everybody hates monopolies? Good question. What's wrong with a monopolist? Usually if you ask someone, they just say, oh, well, they charge what? Super high price? But it's more than that. It's not the high price. The high price doesn't bother economists. So uh, the question is sort of what bothers economists about a monopoly running the market? A lot of the examples you do look at when you see a monopoly, like if you look at FPL, Florida Power and Light, is that what it stands for? Um, they're a monopoly, I think, right? Yes. If you want to buy electricity, I think that's your only option, right? Yeah. If SpaceX is also a monopoly, is it? You can spend all night talking about, you know, how they sort of qualify. Is in like, um, doesn't Bezos have one, though, too? Or? Yeah, but I think it doesn't. Only SpaceX? Oh, that's good. So if you want to try to put a payload into orbit, you have to talk to Elon Musk. <laughs> Even NASA is the competitor. Yeah. I don't know, well, NASA, can you sell something to NASA? To... Anyway, so uh, what was I talking about? Welfare. So we want to talk about what's inefficient about monopoly. Oh, I know, FPL. So usually what happens is that we're going to show what the inefficiencies are associated with a monopolist. And then I'll uh, talk about ways of regulating this too. So there's uh, usually, if you do look at a monopolist like FPL even, they tend to be heavily regulated. So usually the argument is if you do have a monopoly allowed in a market, like FPL is legally operating as a monopoly, of course. 
And so there's usually reasons for that. Um, but then to try to get the output and the pricing that the government wants, they regulate the monopolist. So only one firm can make electricity, but there's a lot of rules that get attached to its operations. Like if they want to raise the price of electricity, what do they have to do? Yeah, they have to ask for permission. Not from us. Oh, yeah. Because we would just say, what? No. No? They have to ask, like, state government. All right, so there tends to be quite a bit of regulation. All right, so uh, we'll uh, talk in more detail about that, but let's start with uh, um, a, an example. Uh, sort of how to solve these um, monopoly problems. All right, so I have my single firm. And they produce uh, some good, say, call it Q. So that's my output. And then we have um, a demand that's always given in these equations for good Q. So <laughs> the, the single firm that's producing the product faces a demand curve. And so that that will always be given in these problems. We'll just focus on the linear demand curves. So we'll keep things linear. If things are non-linear, that's fine too. But then we got to do integrals, and I forgot all that because it's been so long. We don't have integrals, so we can just use geometry, and it's a lot easier. All right, so I'm going to stick to linear demand curves. That was good. You guys remember your integration? Integration by parts. In a meter. All right, so we'll have a demand curve. So demand for good Q, you know, is something like 240 units, just to make something up, minus maybe two times whatever the price is. All right, so a linear demand curve. So this summarizes customer behavior. Also for the firm, we have to have, excuse me, some sort of a cost that's given. Okay, so there's a cost of production, and that can just be given as something like this. So the total cost is going to be a function of mid Q. Maybe there's a fixed cost, like 40, uh, maybe plus 2Q squared. That's an example. All right, so I have a fixed cost of 40, a variable cost 2Q squared, and the firm is uh, facing this demand curve. All right, so... What I'm trying to figure out here is uh, uh, what sort of production would we see if we had this market organized like a, a monopolist? So what would be the output, Q? Um, also, of course, we want to get what sort of price we would see. All right, so first we'll just practice calculating these uh, profit maximization models. And then once that's good, we can look at some of the welfare implications of this choice that the monopolist makes. Okay. All right, so the motive here, of course. What's the motivation behind a monopolist? That's easy, right? That's to maximize profit, right? Or it just kind of makes the objective function very clear. Maximize profit. I'm sure that's what FPL would, would disagree, but we'll say that. Max, um, maximizing profit. So I'm trying to choose an output to maximize, turn this into a math problem, um, total revenue minus total cost. <clears throat> so my total revenue just going to be sell a certain number of units at some sort of price. So I'll say P times Q. That'll be my total revenue, right? And then subtract out my total cost. All right, so my total cost, I have uh, the fixed cost and the variable cost, right? So I'm going to subtract both of those. So minus 40 minus 2P squared. Okay, so I'm trying to pick what quantity would maximize that profit. All right, so the first thing that's different between uh, this week and the previous week is that uh, this um, this price, P, 
that I'm going to be selling the product at is not a constant, right? So this is a not a constant. So it's a big difference between a, a model where you're doing, uh, doing a monopoly and a perfect competition. In a perfectly competitive market, a single firm looks at that market price. That P, right, is just something they can't change. So it's just a P1. No matter what I pick in terms of my output on the horizontal axis there, I double my output, I triple my output. I'm just a little tiny fish in a big pond, so the price doesn't change. I have no... Uh, effect on the price at which the product trades in the big market. All right. And so, of course, if you're the only firm that's producing the product and selling it, uh, that's, um, that's no longer true. Okay. So what makes the problem tricky immediately is that um, this price you can think about um, depends on Q. So, for example, if I'm trying to decide how much output to make in terms of my Q choice, the price will fluctuate. So, for example, if you want to sell more output, so you want to raise Q, then you're going to have to lower the price. Or if you're willing to sell less unit, right, that is a smaller value Q, then you'd be able to sell at a higher price, right? So the uh, question then is how do I... Uh, reflect this non-constant price in this objective function in my profit function. So I need to sort of address this um, fact that uh, P depends on <coughs> what sort of uh, Q I'm producing. Okay, so an easy way to do this is you can go back up to the demand curve so if I go back to my demand curve that's given, and so that was just up here, right? So in this example we're looking at, this is the demand relationship. Uh, you can see in that demand function, there's a relationship between price and Q. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that. So my demand, quantity demanded is 240 minus P minus 2P. <laughs> And so what I want to do is I want to get rid of the price in that profit function right here. So this is the objective function that I'm trying to maximize. And it looks like it's a function with two variables, P and Q. But the truth is you don't actually have control over both of those. That is, if I pick a Q, I'm going to have to charge a specific price. So you can't charge any old price you want. Depends on demand. The way to think about that, right, is what I'm looking at here as a firm is a market for good Q, and there is a, a demand curve out there that looks like this, right? So that's the demand I see out there, right, when I look out the market. So although in the objective function, it looks like there's two variables in there, right? There's a P and a Q. Um, notice what happens, right? If I pick a certain Q, like suppose I decide I want to sell this many units. So I want to sell Q1 units, you know, like 19 or whatever. Um, there's a limit on the price I can charge. So if I pick Q1, then I can go up here to my, uh, this is my what? My uh, demand curve. And there's a specific price here. Uh, it's like a ceiling. You can't charge a price above P1. It'd be nice if you could, but if you charge above P1, you're gonna sell less than Q1 units. So every time you pick a Q value, there's a price associated with it that you need to charge. Okay. Of course, you could charge a lower price than P1, but nobody wants to do that. I want to sell Q1 units, trying to make money. I charge the highest price I can. It'll be P1. All right, so what I need to do then is uh, recognize that in that profit function there, I don't actually have control over both P and Q. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite P in terms of Q using that demand function. 
So what we'll do is um, to capture this, uh, this dependence, let's um, we'll rewrite a P as a function of Q. So if I take my demand curve, which was quantity demanded equals 240 minus 2P, it's going to rearrange it and solve for P in terms of Q. So if I, uh, if I have a specific demand function like this, what I can do is just rewrite this as P on the left side and Q on the right side. Okay, so I'm just going to solve this thing for P in terms of Q. Uh, I got to divide by two, it looks like here. So this is what, 120 <laughs> minus one half Q. Okay, so we didn't invent anything new. We just, it's like rearrange the furniture. You guys ever do that on the weekend? Go in the living room, push the couch over here. No. So wow, maybe feels good to sit over here. So that's all we did, right? Rearrange the furniture in the living room. They have a name for this. This right here is called the demand curve. This one right here, they call any guesses? We call this inverse demand. Does that make sense? This is demand, this is inverse demand because you uh, inverted it, I guess or inverse to it. Right, so it's my inverse demand. So now you're looking at how P is in fact dependent on Q, right? This is that, uh, this is what I was looking for. All right, so if I take the demand curve, re rearrange it into inverse demand, then I can substitute that back into the profit function, right? So if I look at profit, we had P times Q minus, 40 minus 2Q squared, right? <clears throat> Revenue minus cost. So that was just this right here. And so recognizing the fact that you don't have control over P and Q, what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute inverse demand into here. So instead of price, P is a function of Q, so I can just write in 120 minus one half Q times Q minus 40 minus 2Q squared. Is that okay? No complaints. All right, so this is just acknowledging the fact that when I pick a Q, there's going to be a maximum price I can charge. So the constraint, right, even though you're a monopolist and you don't have any competition, there are constraints in life. The constraints in life in this case are the downward sloping demand curve, right? So you have a, a limit on what customers are willing to pay. All right, so you distribute that Q, so you get 120 Q minus one half Q squared minus 40 minus 2Q squared. Okay, and so that right there is just profit. And all I did is I got rid of the price because uh, we didn't really actually control price. You do, in a sense, control price. That is, you can pick P, but then there's a certain Q. You just control one at a time. Right? Yeah, so I mean, you can rewrite this in terms of price as well, theoretically, because you can pick price. The only problem is then the cost gets difficult because cost is a function of Q. So since cost is a function of Q, I chose to make revenue a function of Q. So you have one variable. All right, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to maximize this then. I'm trying to maximize this with respect to Q, of course.
All right, so uh, let's um, look for a critical point, find our first order conditions, first order condition, take the derivative with respect to Q, set that equal to zero. So 120 minus, what would this be? Q. Derivative 40, zero. And set that first derivative equal to zero. Notice your second order condition here. <laughs> Take the second derivative, what do you get? Minus. Minus one, minus four, which is what? So the negative second derivative means the critical point is, uh, you remember this? From Banerjee's class? My local maximum. So the slope's decreasing everywhere. All right, so what I'm looking at is something like this, right? Q dollars. So if you plot this function, you're going to get something like this. So if you plot that profit function, that's going to look like that. It goes down negative, right? Because when Q is zero, you have a profit of negative 40. So that's how these will all look. Um, and you can see that you're trying to maximize this by finding where the slope of the profit function levels out at zero. That's I said slope equal to zero. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Second derivative means that slope keeps decreasing. So, in fact, I found a maximum of a what? Where else is a slope equal to zero? On the top of a mountain and bottom of a valley. So, you don't want a local minimum. So, there's a local maximum. <laughs> All right. So, Got to remember all these steps, right? Rewrite the profit function, eliminate the price, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, which we did right here. Second order condition, just to make sure we're uh, doing this right. And then just solve for Q. So the last step would be right here. So once you have this first order condition, you just solve for Q. So I have on the first order condition, I have um, let's say 120 equals I think 5q, is that right? So 4q plus 1q is 5. And so if I solve that for q, that would be my profit maximizing choice. So 120 divided by 5 is. 24. 24. So 24 units of production will maximize profit. All right, so that's the um, that's the answer. Could you even write right here, you could write done. But we're not. Now I'm gonna keep going. There's always more. But that's uh that's profit maximization for monopolist. So those are the steps you'll take each time. Um sometimes you need other things like you need price. So we're gonna uh produce 24 units for sale as a monopolist. What price should we charge? Price P. So you have a demand curve, so you should be able to figure that out, right? So we have demand. In fact, we even have inverse demand. Remember, we calculated inverse demand. What was that? P equals 120 minus, minus one half Q, right? 
So you can just use that <laughs> or the domain or whatever you want. So if I know that Q is going to be, uh, what is it, 24, I can just plug that in, right? And I get my, uh, so 120 minus, 120 minus 12 is, no wait, no wait. So you charge $108, you sell how many units? 24 units, and then you uh, maximize profit. So real quick, uh, look again at that. Um, <laughs> Same problem where I have my uh, total revenue and total cost. I just want to show you something. So in that first order condition, that was, I think, back up there. There's a little bit of economics inside the first order condition. So to see that, um, the total revenue is uh, P times Q, right? <laughs> and we... Uh, Substituted the inverse demand there, which was 120 minus one half Q. So the revenue function alone was 120 Q minus one half Q squared. And the total cost function was just given, which in this example was 40 plus. 2Q squared. <laughs> and so what the firm is trying to do here is figure out what sort of Q to produce. And so we maximize the difference and then got the 24 units. Another way to look at this is you can do the sort of marginal analysis where if you look at the rate of change on your revenue function. So say we take the derivative of total revenue with respect to Q, you get your marginal revenue. So to take marginal revenue, that would just be the derivative of total revenue. So if this is my total revenue function, for marginal revenue, just take the derivative. So you have uh, 120 <coughs> minus Q. And you do the same thing with marginal cost. So marginal cost is the change in TC. So this is a nonlinear total cost function. So you're going to get a marginal cost that depends on Q. So if you look at marginal cost there, the marginal cost would be the derivative of total cost. So in that case, I think that the derivative of 40 is 0. So this would just be 4Q. <laughs> All right, so if you... Uh, what the firm is doing is uh, you uh, keep producing output as long as the additional revenue I get from selling the unit covers the cost of making it, right? Or to put it in math, keep producing Q as long as your marginal revenue covers your marginal cost. The same principle we use in a competitive market. Um, it's just you get a more elaborate marginal revenue function. So. Well, but they both get the, the same answer, right? Yep. Yeah. In fact, that's that's the sort of the point of showing you this, right? So if you look at this uh, first order condition again. So um, what we did a minute ago was just write down the profit function, took the derivative of it, and the first order condition was 120 minus Q minus 4Q equals zero. So that was the first order condition we had up a minute ago. <laughs> so you can rewrite this like this. So that's 
just the first order condition that we use to solve for Q. So if I rewrite it like this, right, you can see this right here. This right here is the what? This is just marginal revenue. So 120Q is the derivative of the total revenue function. Mm -hmm. Oh, the same thing. And 4Q is what? Oh, marginal, marginal cost, right? So to maximize profit, what we, we effectively did, we didn't know it at the time, right? Because we had marginal revenue and marginal cost. Marginal revenue. So you set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and solve for what? And then they have that optimal choice. Okay, so two ways to do it. Mathematically, it's the same though, but just sort of the uh, two different stories. Pictures worth a thousand words, is that the same? Does that apply to graphs too or not? Graphs worth a thousand words? So let's graph it. How does this look? So here's the market, right, for good Q. There's a demand curve. The demand curve is QD equals 240 minus two times P, remember? That was given. So let's plot that. That's just a linear demand curve, so it looks like this. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's be precise here. So I'll screw this up. My, uh, my horizontal intercept is when P is zero, so I think this is 240. And the vertical intercept on the demand curve for that linear equation would just be a price that makes demand zero, right? So I think that would be, right here, this would be what? 120? <clears throat> so far, so good. Let me plot uh, marginal revenue and marginal cost. What's my marginal revenue? Marginal revenue was, you had it right there, right? Marginal revenue is just 120 minus Q. All that is is a linear equation. Marginal revenue equals 120 minus Q. Vertical intercept for this would be what? Q is zero. So your marginal revenue starts there. And then as Q increases on the horizontal axis, the marginal revenue goes down, right? So you get a straight line by plotting. Um, where would marginal revenue be zero? So marginal revenue would be zero when Q equals 120, 120 which is like right here in the middle, about there. So if you plot this, you get something like this. And this right here is 120. Okay, so the marginal revenue line that the monopolist is looking at is below the demand curve. Um, and now I just want to plot marginal cost. I think we have that too, right? What was that? Marginal cost. That was 4Q. Plot 4Q. How's that look? So it starts here. You just get a straight line like this. It's 4 times Q. When the firm's trying to maximize profit, they keep producing as long as marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. 
making money. And then eventually you can see as you keep increasing production, eventually the marginal cost climbs above marginal revenue. That looks like that happens right about here. So marginal revenue equals marginal cost right there. <clears throat> so where do they cross? How will we maximize our profit? Yeah, so this right here would be how much how many keto? 24. I think it was 24, right? That's what we solved a minute ago. And then what's the price of the charge? 108. So we had 108. So what they do is to pick a price, trying to make money, right? So what I do is if I'm going to make 24 units, then what I'm going to do is go all the way up to the, what was this called right here? This is my demand curve. Mm -hmm. And figure out on demand what's the maximum price you can charge. And still sell uh, 24 units. So I think we had P equals, what was it, 108? Yeah, 108. All right, and so that's the, um, the price. All right, so to find price, you just go up to the demand curve, uh, plug in the Q, and then you have the price. All right, so that's the problem solved for profit maximization. And uh, you can do it those two different ways. This is a common graph that you'll see. All right, so we could do this again. We'll do at least one more of these, but uh, what we got to keep start asking ourselves is, uh, is this, what's the problem with this? Why does the federal government try to prohibit this? What's the problem? They don't always try to prohibit monopoly formation, though, right? Like pharmaceutical companies get a patent. How long does that last? I think 30 years. 30 years? Whatever the time period is. That time period, they're essentially a monopolist, and it's sanctioned by the government. So sometimes they have uh, exceptions to this. So what I'm showing you is just sort of the back of the envelope textbook description of why monopolies are considered bad, right? So we'll do that. And then, of course, there are exceptions. Like a pharmaceutical company, they give them a patent, I guess, because they have to uh, incentivize them to the incentivize, cover research and development, that kind of stuff. So what's the problem with this? You're charging $108, you're selling 24 units. And so what I'd like you guys to be able to do eventually is sit down with a blank piece of paper and write out a paragraph or two and tell me what's wrong with this. Why are monopolies bad? Anybody remember this from a intermediate micro? Principles? I'm guessing because we're not saying the price at where marginal revenue and marginal cost meet, we're saying it above at the demand curve. Yeah, so the, the, your, your intuition's right. So we maximize profit by equating marginal revenue, marginal costs, and use that to calculate Q. And we got an answer of 24 units. But the price we're charging is up there on the demand curve of 108. So you have this high price at 108. The problem here, and we'll formalize this in a second, the problem stems from the fact that the price is up here at $108, and the marginal cost of production is down here. Like, in fact, if you just plug this in, you could probably calculate it. Like, on the last unit that the firm produces, so they produce 24 units total, say, say you ask the firm, what was your marginal cost on the 24th unit? So you should be able to figure that out because we have that marginal cost function, right? So you can plot that. Twenty-four 
Jordan Forest, 96. 96. Look at the wrong thing. So 96 would be, so I'm just using, uh, I'm just using uh, this right here, right? Yeah. So 96. Okay, so there's an inefficiency here. That's the problem. And the, the idea behind the inefficiency is that the marginal cost on the last unit produced for the firm was $96. Uh, but the demand curve up here is a reflection of a willingness to pay by the consumers. Sometimes they say demand is a reflection of the marginal benefit of consumption. Like you're only going to buy the product and pay that price if the product generates a benefit for you of at least $108. So the customer who buys the last unit has a marginal benefit of 108, and the cost of making the last unit is only 96. And so just for the sake of argument, think about something like this. You have a customer here that's willing to pay that price for an additional unit, right? So if I go from like 24 to 25, you can even calculate it. Like if this is 25, this is, I'm just trying to give you the intuition behind the inefficiency. So if we go 25 right here, then there's a price a customer's willing to pay, right? And we have an um, additional unit. What would that price be? I should be able to figure that out using my inverse demand, I think, right? So if Q is 25, what would P be? So I think my inverse demand was P equals, what was it? 120 minus one half Q. So if I make that 25, what would that be? Half of 25 is 12.5. 120 minus 12.5? 107.5. So the idea is that you could sell another unit, the 25th unit, right? Company can sell one more unit, the 25th unit. Think of it as a new customer walks in the shop, right? Mm -hmm. They have a whole new look to them. They come in and they say, I'd like to buy the what? 25th. In order to get them in the store, I just have to drop the price down to 107.50. That is, it looks like I have to drop the price 50 cents. Is that right? Yeah. And then the customer walks in, says, now I'm, I'm on board. I'd like to buy it. Right? How much does it cost the firm to make the 25th unit? Because it's, costs keep going up, right? So we have to recognize that too, right? The cost to make the 25th unit is this right here. So that would be a hundred. So there you would just take 25 and plug that in here, right? Yeah. And so the cost of making that is 100. All right, so here's the essence of it, right? There's a customer who's willing to come in the front door and pay $107.50 to buy the product. And when they do that, they feel they're better off, right? They want to. It's voluntary. They're willing to pay this money to the company to get the 25th product. The cost of making the product, right, that one, that one unit, the 25th unit, it looks like they're going to have to pay for more. So this is just my marginal cost of production. So the cost of making that unit is $100. Yes. Which will be greater than the revenue. But the customer is willing to pay 107.5. So if it costs me $100 to make it, and the customer is willing to pay $107.50 to buy it, why don't I make it? Because the marginal road is still going to be less than the marginal cost. Because you plug in 25, it's going to be 90. Yeah, so you definitely want to equate these. Like, um, I'm not kidding. We did this right. That is the profit maximizing choice is 24. 
So we equated marginal revenue, marginal cost, and that's what maximizes profit. But what I'm trying to do is <laughs> for the sake of a puzzle, right? If you have a customer who's willing to pay $107.50 and it only costs 100 to make, why not make it and sell it to them? Like you could charge them what? 105 bucks or something? You make money, right? They're happy. So the question is, why isn't that customer grabbed by the firm or the market and sold the unit? Why not produce an additional unit and bring the customer in if that customer right there, that single customer is profitable? They're willing to pay more than it costs to make it. So you should make it. But why do you not do that? So here's the reason. The reason is in order to get that customer in the door, you have to do what? Lower the price. You have to lower the price to him and to who else? Well, everybody else. Everyone else. So you're overall. Right? So overall, it's going to hurt you. So I want to lower the price for that customer to bring them in because they're willing to pay this and only cost this to make it. I can make money on that one customer. The problem is if I lower the price from 108 to 107.5, I have to lower the price for, for everyone. And you lose money on those 24 customers who were willing to pay the higher price. Yeah? I was going to say airlines... Uh, uh change the price to, to depending on who's buying it so an example of that yeah yeah i mean i guess this isn't an airline but but aren't there business models where you can kind of change the price depending on per person oh right yeah so they actually uh right exactly so what i what I, this is this is um this is a perfectly good example where you might say if the firm is is, is innovative enough they can figure out how ideally what if I just charge the 25th customer 107.5, but I charge everybody else, uh, what is it? 108. All right, so it's like I have a special price just for uh, this 25th customer. Then what happens is I gain profit on this 25th customer and I get to keep all the money I'm making on the other 24 customers. So I, sell the same product to different consumers and at different consumers I charge them different prices. Right, so the customer walks in the shop, right? And you're saying for you, $107. Someone else walks in for you, $108. We've all probably walked into stores like that at one point in our life. They look you in the eyes, say the price. Kind of scary. So they call that what? What do they call that in economics? Called price discrimination. So if the monopolist can pull off price discrimination, then you're exactly right. Okay. Then you can produce more product at a lower price and keep the price on the existing customers high. There are examples of it. <laughs> like a common one they always bring up in the textbooks are, uh, oh, does anybody still go to the movies or is that over? Like, I like to stream a lot. Yeah, so I guess nobody goes to the theaters. But in the old days, if theaters are still in business, they charge old people like me one price, like 20 bucks or whatever, and then they charge uh, students. They still do that. If you have yeah. a student ID, you get a discount. They do that, but like on one day of the week or something. Yeah, so that's an example. So that's an example of price discrimination, where what you're trying to do is partition the market into different groups so that you can get away with stuff like this. Mm -hmm. All right, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about price discrimination later. Um, if, if you don't have price discrimination, though, what happens is you get an inefficiency here. So the problem, if you get asked with a monopolist, is that at the <laughs> quantity choice that they make, and you can see it in the picture, so if I look at this picture right here, that marginal benefit on the demand curve is greater than the marginal cost of production. And what happens is there's consumers out there in the market who have a value to the product that exceeds the cost of making it. So it seems like we should produce it, but we don't because we're trying to make the keep those profits we have. And so what happens is when the monopolist does this, it's sort of like 
One way to put it really simply is that the output is too low. And the marginal benefits greater than the marginal cost, and this creates what they call a dead weight loss in the market. So it's an inefficiency that you can measure. All right, so let me. Uh, this is a this graph is getting uh, increasingly messy and dirty. So let's start with some fraction. Do a new example, and I'll just show you how to calculate the inefficiency. Does that sound sound familiar? Dead weight loss. Yeah. No? Dead weight loss is a measure of the inefficiency due to the monopolist. So that's the reason monopoly formation is discouraged. Not because the price is high. So it's not, it's not only because the price is high, right? Because price is high, right, but that's not the source of the problem. So just because the price is high, that doesn't bother the economists. The price is way above the marginal cost. Sometimes price is high just because of marginal costs or what? You gotta charge a high price because your costs are high. Let's do a new example real quick and measure dead weight loss. So what I want to do is I measure the inefficiency. Okay, so let's do some new uh, some new example. So we can find this. Okay, so my firm produces good Q, there's a demand curve. So let's say that's my demand curve for good Q, and then I have some sort of cost. Let's say this is um, N plus, how about uh, 10Q? Okay, so the first thing I want to do is figure out what my profit maximizing choice of the monopolist is. So the same steps we did before. So like suppose I'm going to do that second approach, total revenue is P times Q. Right, that's my revenue. I'm going to calculate marginal revenue, then I'm going to calculate marginal cost, and I'm going to set the two equal. Do it that way. Right, so uh, I need price, right? So remember what we did last time? Um, you know, P, P is a function of Q. So I can take the demand curve that's given. Quantity demand equals 100 minus 1 half P and solve for the inverse demand. So 1 half P equals 100 minus Q where P equals 200 minus 2Q. Okay, so rearrange the demand curve, solve for P in terms of Q, take the inverse demand and substitute that into the revenue function. So total revenue equals, for P I'm gonna put in 200 minus 2Q. So now P went away, right? And then when I simplify this out of 200Q, Minus 2q squared. All right, so that's my total revenue function. <laughs> so uh, marginal revenue is just going to be the derivative of that, right? So marginal revenue is the derivative of that total revenue function. So you get 200 minus 4q. Okay, so that's marginal revenue. And I need total, uh, I have total costs, I need marginal cost. Marginal cost is you just take the derivative of total cost with respect to Q. <laughs> All right, so in this case, here's my total cost function. So if I take the derivative of that, I get a, looks like this time it's a little bit easier, 10. So make the geometry a little easier. So I have a marginal cost of 10. 
Every time you make a, a unit, you face additional cost of $10. All right, so now we're just going to try to uh, maximize profit. Okay, so to do that, uh, what we'll do is remember right from the earlier example, set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Okay, so we calculated the both sides of this. I got the MR and I have the MC. So MR is 200 minus 4Q and marginal cost is 10. So set those equal. Um, so 4Q equals 210. So 210 divided by four. Fifty-two point five. So that would be my profit maximizing choice. Look good. All right. So let's measure the inefficiency. So what's wrong with this? Well, we'll see. Same thing as last time. When the firm stops at fifty-two point five, the price that they're charging for the product exceeds the marginal cost of production. But the ten goes there is going to be minus, so it's supposed to be one ninety. Oh, you're right. This is uh, those rules of algebra, right? One one ninety. Thank you. That'll screw things up later. So this right here is one hundred ninety divided by four, right? So, what's that? One twenty. So when I'm uh, when I'm doing this on my own, I'm just recording. I don't have anybody here to fix my problems, so I would have just continued. And Thirty minutes later, found a, something that didn't make any sense. Do your other professors ever make mistakes? Yep. Oh, they do. No worries. You can get around that if you just have PowerPoint, you know, it's all solved. All right, so let's uh, let's measure the inefficiency. To measure the inefficiency, you just calculate the dead weight loss. We need the dead weight loss. All right, trying to remember what it is. Again, the motivation is the price for charging is above the marginal cost of production. So that's what we capture. So this is a uh, this is a little bit easier this with this one um, because I have a a, mar a fixed marginal cost of n. So but some of this stuff looks the same. So you have a demand curve like this. So quantity demanded was one hundred minus one hundred. So this is one hundred and this is two hundred. And your marginal revenue line is this, right? This is marginal revenue right here. So if you plot that, you get, uh, again, the horizontal intercept is going to be 50, so it goes like this. Marginal cost, this one's a little bit easier. Marginal cost is 10. So that looks like this. Off the maximizing is always where the two cross, so right here. The keep producing as long as marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, which gave me 47.5. See, at that point, I would have been confused, right? Because this is at, what, 52.5? It's got to be the limit. So we would have found trouble eventually. Good, good, good. All right, so they maximize profit by equating marginal revenue and marginal cost. That's the same thing a perfectly competitive firm does, right? So that's not the problem by itself. 
Um, problem is uh, coming next year, right? That is, you have a price up here that's way higher than your marginal cost of production. We don't know what it is yet, but we should be able to figure it out, right? What is this price here that they're charging to sell 47.5 units? We can use the inverse demand. I think this was it right here, right? So two times 47.5 and then subtract that from 200. Just trying to back that price out. Uh, what you guys get is that 105? We didn't do that earlier, right? Okay, so the, uh, again, the argument's the same. Um, I'm trying to get the inefficiency. And so the idea is that the, the company stops too early. They only produce 47.5 units. Um, and the marginal benefit on the last unit produced is $105. So someone values the product, so to speak, at $105. That's why they bought it. And you can see, as you continue to uh, produce output beyond 47.5, those marginal benefit figures here and here and so on, for all of these, marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. Customers are willing to pay a much higher price than the cost to make the unit. The cost to make the additional unit is always what? Pound box. But people are willing to pay really high prices, $104, $102. Someone's willing to pay $100. Cost of making it is only $10. So in a perfect world, they should be made. Is the people value it, they have a benefit much higher than it costs to make it. So you want to produce it. But we know that the monopolist stops here to preserve the profit, right? So they don't want to lower the price because they got to lower the price on everybody. So in the absence of price discrimination, I'm going to keep the price stuck at 105. And then I have all these frustrated people. All right, so to measure the frustration, what I want to do for deadweight loss, does remember deadweight loss? Yeah. This is basically measuring the difference, right, between the marginal benefit of consumption on the demand curve and the cost of production. That gap is inefficiency. Someone's willing to pay like $104, say, to get the good. It only costs $10 to make. Then what are we missing out on? We're missing out in society 104 minus 10. That would be surplus gain to everyone if the product was in fact produced and traded. Someone values it $104, $104 worth of happiness when they consume it, and it only costs $10 to make. The fact that it's not produced, then the difference is what they call surplus that's lost. So to capture that, what you're gonna look at for your dead weight loss is basically all of this area under the demand curve and above the marginal cost curve of production. So this red triangle right here is what they call the dead weight loss. This is the source of the inefficiency in a monopoly. All right, so the dead weight loss. If you have a flat marginal cost line like this, you can just do the formula for the area of a, a right angle. Uh, triangle, right? One half base times height. Is that what they still call it in school? So, my base would just be what we're looking at is this uh, the base right here for the triangle, right? Base and my height. And so that area is measured in dollars, and that's the, the degree of the inefficiency from the monopolist. 
So for the base, I'm going to need to know what this is right here. To get the base on the triangle. So this is just a point on the demand curve right here, right? This is demand. So what I can do is I can use inverse demand. So the inverse demand is P equals 200 minus 2Q. So if I know, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that right. Uh, I have P is 10, so I just need to figure out what demand is at 10, right? So quantity demanded when the price is 10, and the demand curve was 100 minus one half P. So 100 minus five is 95. So this is 95 right here. All right, so my base is 95 minus 47.5. My red triangle, everybody see the triangle there? And my, uh, what's the height? 105 minus 10. Thank. So we got to do all this now. Here we go. So 95. This is what? 95? So I have two thousand two hundred fifty-six point twenty-five. Okay, so that's the measure of the inefficiency. So if we allow monopolists to uh, operate in the market, the cost to society is two thousand two hundred fifty-six dollars and twenty-five cents. This is why people love economics so much. You can put suffering into a number. You present it to senators. See, Senators, if we don't get rid of the monopolists, society misses out on $2,256.25. Very specific, you know? You go to those other social sciences, like what? Philosophy. Philosophy, history, sociology, political science, they don't have this. I don't know if it's right. Well, this is right. The model's right, the math's right. It just might be different in reality. So that would be the dead weight loss. So you guys can calculate dead weight loss. You guys remember consumer surplus, producer surplus, all that? Yeah. So there still is consumer surplus. We can go over that too. Yeah. Uh, in this picture, uh, we have seen the dead weight loss, the triangle. In the previous example, how did we plot the dead weight loss? Yeah, that was that's why that's why I changed the example. <laughs> so this one's a little. You can do this too. Good question. Yeah. So my dead weight loss is two thousand two hundred fifty six. The, the Q star, where the firm stops, they stop where? 24, right? 24, they stop here. Mm -hmm. And then what we're looking at is, uh, that's probably, it's probably too little. Because the inefficiency is they produce too little. Because beyond that, the marginal benefit on the demand curve is above the marginal cost. And that's the inefficiency. There should be more production because people are willing to pay more than it costs to make. So I want to look at the area under demand and what? Above marginal cost, right? So that's what we did here. Look. So this the dead weight loss is always below demand and above marginal cost. So if you're doing this picture, you just have some uh, trickier trickier geometry, right? So here's demand, and then here's marginal cost. 
So this would be your deadweight loss right there. So you gotta turn that into like, I don't know, how do you find the area of that? I think you can find the area of the two right angle triangles. Then you can calculate the area. If everything's linear, it's not that bad. What happens is when the domain curve's non-linear, right? So if the domain curve looks like like if I wanted to torture you guys, right? Make you suffer, maybe on homework. Should we do homework? Do your other professors make you guys suffer? Yes. So, so like suppose this is the demand curve. And then here's your marginal cost. And so if you're trying to find this area here, then you gotta do uh what do you gotta do? Integrals. Integrals and stuff. It's fun. So usually we don't do it just because nobody wants to take a, an integral at eight o'clock at night. Um, so we'll just keep a linear. I mean, you don't add anything new here. It's just uh, it's just a whole bunch of extra stupid math. But the same thing applies. Sounds good. All right, I think I'll stop there. I'm tired. I'll make another video tomorrow, I hope. Uh, maybe not tomorrow. I'll try tomorrow. If not tomorrow, I'll do Friday. Tomorrow's kind of looking bad. But I'll get a video out. And so